welcome everybody to People and the Planet, the future of development in a post-COVID-19 world. That is a question. It is also a statement. Are we asking or are we shaping? This is a conversation for all of us. Welcome if you're watching on Zoom. Welcome if you're watching on YouTube. Welcome if you're watching on the UNDP website. Really good to see you. Now, this is not a voyeur process, okay? We are not just going to be asking you to look at us. We are going to ask you to engage as well. We have a team in the Zoom uh, platform. We have a team on the YouTube platform, and they're looking out for your comments and your questions so you too can be part of this conversation. So for the next... Mm, up until the next, let me see, uh, one hour and uh, 40 minutes or so, we are going to be talking about what do we do for development in a post-COVID-19 world? What are the plans right now? How do we build back better? How do we build back greener? And your thoughts, your suggestions, your even challenges and suggestions for our panel. So let me introduce the panel to you so you, they can introduce themselves to you as well. Akim, welcome. It's so good to see you, people and the planet, the future of development in a post-COVID-19 world. Akim, for a few people who may not know who you are and what you do, introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Femi, and welcome to everybody who has joined us for this uh, wonderful discussion today. My name is Achim Steiner. I head the United Nations Development Program working uh, for probably about 100 days now out of my living room here in New York City. Thank you. Very good to have you. Inga, it is great to see you. Nice to have you on this panel. I know it's going to be a good one because you and Akim are on it together. Inga, tell everybody who you are. Do your own introduction. Here we go. Uh, my name is Inger, Inger Anderson, and I'm the head of the United Nations Environment Program. Uh, we're based out of Nairobi. Right now I'm sitting in a somewhat dark room, so you have to forgive me, because I got stuck in Denmark, and I haven't installed lights yet, because this is a brand new house. But we'll get to more, <laughs> some more important issues. So sorry about that, but I think you can just about see my shape. Over to you, Femi. Uh, we see you beautifully. Nice to see you, Inga. Raya, welcome to... Thank you. People and the planet, so good to see you. Tell everybody who you are. Do your own introduction. So my name is uh, Raya Hafar. Um, I'm a former Minister of Finance in the Lebanese Republic. And I served uh, uh, between 2009 and 2011 uh, on more propitious times than we see right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a former Minister of Interior and Municipalities. Uh, and our government resigned like four or five months ago. So... Uh, Today, um, <laughs> jobless. <laughs> ah, and, and, and jobless, but hopeful because of that great smile. Sure. Also, I, I'm, I'm just thinking, uh, I'm impressed that you don't have more gray hairs because that is a job and a half in Lebanon. There's so many <laughs> exactly. challenges there. Exactly. I, I, I'm looking forward to you bringing your wisdom, your experience to this conversation. I hope so. Really, I hope really so. nice um, to see you. Am I on now? Hello there, Vina. Uh, and the, that voice you heard was Professor Stiglitz. Professor Stiglitz is, is uh, joining us as well. Professor Stiglitz, hold tight for a moment. You are live. We do hear you. But let me just say hello to Bina, first of all. Hi there, Bina. Hi, hi, Femi. Hello. So I'm a professor of development economics and environment at the University of Manchester at the Global Development Institute. And I was formerly a director and professor of economics at the Institute of Economic Growth in Delhi. I mentioned this because I spend my time in the UK and in India. And at the moment, I'm in New Delhi. Very good. And I see in the background, just getting ready, Professor Joseph Stiglitz. Nice to see you, Professor. Are you, are you ready for prime time? Tell everybody who you are. Do your own introduction. It will be an excellent one because you're doing it yourself. Okay, I'm Joseph Stiglitz. Uh... I teach at Columbia University, uh, and I'm an economist. Very good. Nice to see you, and great to have you here in the mix. All right, everybody, I am going to ask you, panel, one rule. Do not turn your microphones off. Have them on all of the time, so we never get those little instances where we see your mouth moving, 
but uh, but no sound is coming out. So everybody's going to be unmuted, but also means that you have to be on your best audio behavior. We are going to set the scene here for what you think about this idea of the post-COVID-19 world. What does it look like? I'm looking for your scene setter, your elevator pitch, because I know there are lots of questions, lots of comments to come in. But first of all, we will actually just start with that. So, uh, Akim, wondering for you, this vision that you have for development in a post-COVID-19 world, it could be disastrous. We're in a disaster right now. How do you see the future? Thank you, Femi. And I think um, by nature, I'm an optimist, but I think uh, realism is the order of the day. And if we look at uh, where we are right now at this very moment, it is truly a moment of disruption. Uh, disruption, I think, is in a sense neutral as to what happens next, but we know that disruption on a scale and across the globe in a synchronized fashion as we are witnessing right now is almost without precedent. So the Human Development Report Office issued just a few days ago an update on the Human Development Index. And just to give you a sense, for the first time in 30 years of preparing such an index, we are actually regressing. This is without precedent, and I think many of the numbers we see right now speak to the depth and also to the emergency of the current situation. And this is obviously for somebody who has spent his life working in development, uh, an issue to not only be very frustrated about, it is deeply troubling, because if you're not careful, not only will we, in a sense, have to confront many of the fallouts, economic freefall, social disruption, but also the actions that we need to take about the future of life in our communities, in our countries, with a perspective to sustainability. All of this at the moment is um, in great uh, disarray. And so I think our discussion this morning hopefully will focus on how do we now confront choices we need to make under extremely challenging circumstances with many people having already lost their livelihoods. How do we get back, but not back to where we were before, but back in a sense onto a trajectory where development is something that people can be hopeful about and that addresses the fundamentals of what otherwise will tear us apart, inequality and unsustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Akeem. Professor Stiglitz, I, I do hear you a little bit in the background, so I'm just gonna ask you, because your microphone is up, that we hear you getting ready. So if you can keep that level just a little bit lower, that would be wonderful. We are getting some welcomes from our audience. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Rashmi Shran uh, from Kathmandu. And uh, Rashmi says, I would like to thank you for the opportunity and she's looking forward to the enlightening discussion. And Professor Bina, one of your students graduated from the University of Manchester. And really you. looking forward to your conversation. Let's continue with the scene setting. I want to go to uh, In Inga. And uh, Inga, I'm, I'm thinking you're, you're right now, you're in a lockdown situation. You're in a part of the world you would not normally be in. And many people have said, when we look at COVID-19, that is the earth getting its reset because we behave badly as mankind. That nature is saying, aha, you thought you were so clever, not so fast. Can you help us understand that connection between the health of, pla of the planet and biodiversity and that connection that people were, were making very early on as uh, nature bounced back, the environment had a little party as we were all stuck in our homes, Inga? Well, yes, I mean, in a sense, uh, while we have been in our cages, nature has shown up in places where they feel, where animals feel they should be. Our, our cities uh, have seen cleaner air, etc. But it's not time to take that victory lap because this is not how we will get to uh, a cleaner, greener world by locking up humanity and having um, what is happening right now to our economies happen and have the economic growth and opportunity grind to a complete halt. But clearly we have to take some uh, stock as to what it is we've been doing. And what we have been doing is we've been pushing nature into a corner. We've been fragmenting um, the nature. It's no longer, you know, uh, contiguous, so to speak. 75% of the Earth's surface has been developed by us, have been interfered with or impacted by our activities, land and, la land and sea. And uh, we have uh, traded illegally wildlife, mixed species up that should be in different corners or on different continents uh, with a degree of regularity and a degree of intensity, which I hope we'll get into in our discussion, and thereby have caused the, the ability of zoonotic diseases 
to jump more frequently and with greater intensity to the human population. Mm -hmm. So yes, nature is sending us a message. And yes, we have to, to reflect, therefore, on how we look at growth, how we look at economic development, and how we look at our economies, and how we look at nature as an asset, as an asset class. More from Inga in just a moment. Professor Stiglitz, great to have you joining us. I know you've been looking at various stimulus packages that have come from the lockdowns and the uh, economy uh, having to be stimulated around the world because of COVID-19 and the link between that and the impact on climate action, climate change. You've written a paper about this. I'm not going to ask you to bring the whole paper to us, but just the headline, and then we'll go deeper as we go deeper into our conversation. Professor Stiglitz, over to you. Yeah, well, the basic idea is a very simple one. Uh, it's very clear that we're going to need to spend more money to restore the economy. And the question is, uh, how do we spend the money? And uh, the... Our analysis said that uh, you should be spending it with a vision of where you want to be. And where you want to be when we come out is not where we were before. What we want to do is to have a greener economy. And that green spending, if you want to call it that, green spending can be more timely, more effective, more labor intensive so that it addresses some of the problems of inequality. Uh, larger multipliers uh, and therefore as we think about you know we've never intervened in the economy in the scale that we have uh, in uh, recent months so this is a real opportunity since we're intervening in the economy in any case to try to reshape the economy reshape our society to move us in a in a direction which is not only greener but also more equal So we are scene setting right now. The idea of people and the planet, the future for development in a post COVID-19 world. Uh, I, I love that the professors have brought a lot of their, their students with them. I'm not sure deliberately, but wherever you go, your students are following Professor Stiglitz. Uh, this is Gustavo Cetrini. Uh, Gustavo says, uh, Professor Stiglitz, I was your student at Manchester Brooks Institute summer program on poverty, globalization and development when I was a doctoral student at MIT. Now I am at the UNDP in Paraguay. So that is what happens to your students, Professor Stiglitz. Really nice to see you, Gustavo. We are expecting excellent questions from you. So get asking those questions. Thank you, everybody. This, as you can tell, is a very interactive conversation. Your comments, your questions. If you've got suggestions for our panels, they are uh, in very important positions and they could do with your help for shaping development post COVID-19. Raya, great to have you. Scene Same set here. for us. How are you seeing this topic from your perspective? Uh, definitely, the pandemic has has challenged the uh, nor normative structures of uh, of behavior, uh, of consumption of many countries, and of production, of course. Um, on a more profound level, I think the the crisis has uh, uh, perpetuated existing inequalities uh, in development, in gender, in income, uh, you know, in digital accessibility, and I see. Uh, Though the uh, prospects today, if we look at them, are grim. However, I would like to think these also pose uh, an opportunity, an opportunity, opportunity to build for the future, or uh, an opportunity to basically rethink our economic models, or to rethink our social contracts. Uh, any crisis brings about it, with it uh, an opportunity. And if we are smart enough, if the global leaders are smart enough, definitely this crisis con can turn into an opportunity that will build for more sustainable economy. Mm, good to hear that. Uh, more from Raya in just a moment, but we go now to Bina. Bina, your students are already watching. No pressure. If, if we're scene <laughs> setting for you on this topic, this idea of uh, human development post COVID-19, also developing countries as well. Uh, how does that all connect up from your perspective, from your expertise? Well, um, hi everybody. And I, uh, you know, I'm also an optimist by nature, but I'm afraid at this point, um, I find that uh, the situation is pretty dire and I would call it developmental re reversals. 
and environmental reversals. Um, and I'll, I'll say a few words on that because not only economically we are seeing a global recession looming, but also the poverty figures are really alarming. So there's a recent study which um, by UNU wider, which said we'll add 395 million people to extreme poverty and some more than 50% will be in South Asia, which is my region. Um, and there's, uh, you know, another kind of development pathway because normally we, we think of people moving from villages to cities and from agriculture to industry, but the pandemic has actually has brought a reverse exodus uh, on a scale that we've never seen before. Um, so as, as you, all of us watch TV uh, and one of the most searing images uh, in, 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 in my mind is of uh, millions of migrant workers in India Walking, walking thousands of miles um, to the back to the villages, unemployed, penniless, and hungry, and many died en route. So hunger is in fact growing globally, and I think eliminating hunger uh, and poverty, which has been in the SDG uh, goals, will be a challenge. Um, but interestingly, also importantly, environmentally, uh, this reverse migration uh, could lead to an overcrowding in agriculture, in rural jobs, and on our natural ecosystems, which is why I said we could have uh, environmental reversals. Um, we, uh, perhaps we tend to forget uh, sometimes that uh, forests and ecosystems in rural areas are uh, a very important source of uh, livelihood. Um, something like one in six rural persons, and especially women, depend on forests and commons for basic needs, firewood, fodder, non-timber products. Um, somebody had an, uh, Thieb had an estimate of the GDP of the poor, which was about 47% for India, as over 80% for Brazil. So what this means is that if people go back, the question is, they will, for coping strategies, they might draw more on the natural environment. And similarly, they might draw more on um, agriculture, but we have already uh, quite a lot of crowding in agriculture. So it seems to me that we have to watch out on what's going to happen to our natural capital. And already we know that uh, from 1992 to 2014, according to UNEP's own figures, um, in almost 140 countries studied by them, the natural <clears throat> capital per capita uh, declined during this period, even while GDP was growing. Uh, so it's, a, it's, it's an important contrast that we can have growth in GDP per capita. We've been so fixated on growth. And at the same time, we've been depleting our natural capital. So um, all this doesn't bode so well for sustainability, either of livelihoods or of ecosystems. But then one can ask, are these development reversible, re reversals inevitable? I would say in the short run, yes, but not necessarily in the long run, uh, because uh, it seems to me that it's precisely agriculture and the rural economy, which has the most potential for transformation, uh, but it will require cooperation, it will require move to more equitable development, and it will require institutional transformation. Now, if we do make that a centerpiece of our efforts in the post-COVID uh, post recovery, uh, then I think uh, we do have a potential for the transformation that others uh, before me uh, have just mentioned. I'm going to open up now so that we can have a, a more organic conversation. And that organic conversation, we're going to start with Build Back Better. How can we make more egalitarian societies from the situation where we are in right now looking ahead to the future. Everybody's microphone is off, uh, and so you can interject at any point. I really want this to feel like we're all sitting around a table brainstorming, and that includes the 800 people who are actually following us right now, and you're in this conversation. Your comments, your questions are already coming through. I'm gonna weave them in. For us, panel, if you wanna do a little finger waggle, I will be looking out for the finger waggle, so I know that you wanna be in the conversation. Um, and then even if you're looking quizzical, I will bring you in anyway. So there is no escaping. Akin, this idea of build back better and policies, I know you're formulating them already. Where are you starting as the UNDP? Well, I think first of all, by looking back perhaps at the last crisis we faced, the, the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009, and you, you may recall that at that time, 
uh, unit together with uh, Professor Bhatti and, and Pavan Sukhdev and many others in the international community put forward a, a, a global Green New Deal at the time. And it was interesting because, in fact, Professor Stiglitz, together with Lord Nicholas Stern and Professor Cameron, recently put out a report that looked at about 700 green stimulus measures that have been taken over the last um, decade, decade and a half to basically, first of all, understand, do these things work? I mean, are we able to build back better if we make the choice to do so? And the good news is, yes, they actually work. They looked at over 700 of these measures and largely concluded that they actually had their intended effect. So two things I think are critical when we talk about building back better. First of all, why is it that this is even being debated? Because frankly speaking, common sense, the ability to act, is self-evident. You don't want more people in poverty. You don't want a planet that is increasingly under stress. You don't want the next generation to have no choice anymore in addressing climate change. So our first problem is that whenever we come out of a crisis, the temptation is to go back to what was there before, because frankly speaking, those who held power and those who were doing very well in that economy have every interest to get back to what was there before. But, you know, just look at what was happening on the streets of the world's capitals in the last two years. People were stepping out into the street, not looking at the political process. They were protesting about inequality, about climate change from Hong Kong to Santiago de Chile, to Beirut, to Paris. This is a moment in which people already did not consider the normal that was there before actually acceptable. So one challenge we face is there are those who have a lot of vested interest in simply going back to the normal of before. At the same time, I think we are in the midst of a moment where the opportunity to leapfrog forward is actually becoming very palpable, whether it is on technology. And look at the whole implication of living in the digital age. We are seeing countries stand up um, cash transfer programs in the matter of a fortnight right now in order to reach people who otherwise would have no income. This is without precedent. It's happening in many countries. It's an extraordinary illustration of temporary basic income as a measure. But also the issue of climate change, of investing in renewable energy, the ability to now move forward when it is already a highly competitive energy generating uh, set of technologies, solar, geothermal, wind, just to mention a few, the transition to electric mobility. These are opportunities where in the midst of investing extraordinary amounts of money to stabilize our economies, we could actually transform them as we move forward. These are choices, but it's the real economy, it's the financial economy that need to be aligned. Because if you look at the stock exchanges, you'd think they were almost out of the crisis already, while the world is still in free fall. So these are some of the, let's say, challenges that we should confront in our discussion today, because we all agree what would be common sense, build back better. But why is it a very high risk proposition that this may not happen? And I very much look forward to the discussion. Thank you. I was watching Raya holding her head. Raya, it, it may be because of your former job uh, in Lebanon in terms of, of finance, but this idea of building back better where there were so many parts of the world where they were even struggling just build anything. Exactly. Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, are we yeah. being realistic here? Um, yes and no. I mean, obviously our, our region, the region where I come from, the Arab region, is going through an unprecedented crisis even before the pandemic hit. I mean, if we're talking about tumbling oil prices, if we're talking about regional conflicts or about the, the refugee crisis or about you know, uh, governance structures uh, whereby they're not necessarily based on principles of accountability and, and sustainability and transparency. I mean, how can the Arab region really face such a huge amount of challenges with limited fiscal space? You know, a lot of countries now are throwing money, are spending, are, are basically, uh, you know, doing fiscal stimulus or gross stimulus packages. A lot of our countries, those that are marred in regional conflicts or other kinds of crises, don't have the fiscal space to basically spend themselves out of the crisis or to uh, basically push an early recovery. So we have a, a real problem. And, and I think, you know, some of the problem, obviously it's our responsibilities to, to address and we need to do that through socioeconomic uh, structural reforms. We need to basically bring the youth uh, into, into, you know, or leverage the talents uh, of the youth in order to spearhead 
uh, economic recovery. And there's a lot of things that we need to do in order to basically address the structural unemployment and other structural problems we have. But we cannot do it alone. I mean, it's obvious that we need help. And I'm not talking about the oil producing countries. I'm talking about, you know, those countries, uh, as I said, who have uh, been suffering for a long time from, from regional conflicts, Syria, uh, Lebanon, uh, Iraq, Libya, Yemen. I mean, these countries cannot do it by themselves. Obviously, we have to remove the influence of the uh, political and, and geopolitical uh, uh, you know, repercussions on these countries. But at one point, uh, the international community has to step in, just as stepping in with the refugee crisis, even though in my opinion, it's not enough, but they have to step in and try to, you know, provide support, uh, whether technical support, whether financial support, whether budget support to these uh, companies in order to be able to face this uh, unprecedented crisis that they are facing. Professor Stiglitz, Oscar Garcia is watching this conversation right now and he wants to know where does the money come from and what are the consequences of potential higher levels of debt for developing countries? Well, uh the, the issue here is uh, not a matter of choice. Uh, when you go to war, you don't say, are we going to have the resources? Uh, you figure out uh, how to do it. And the way we are at a war with a, uh, with a very terrible virus, and, and we have to figure out. Uh, for the advanced countries, like the United States, uh, I'm not very worried. Uh, we, we have the... Uh, fiscal resources, uh, eventually, I'm sure it's going to require us to raise taxes on the wealthy uh, and uh, that uh, to, to raise uh, taxes on environments. Some of this is just uh, because we have a regressive tax system. Some of this is just making th those who are uh, wealthy pay their fair share of taxes. Uh, but uh, for the developing world, there is a problem, uh, and I do worry about that, uh, and that's why uh, it was both. It was very good that the G20 said that they'll use every instrument uh, at their disposal to make sure that their resources are available for the developing countries. The unfortunate thing was that in the IMF spring meeting, uh, even though the head of the IMF urged. Uh, an issuance of $500 billion of SDRs that would have made a very big difference. Uh, there were a couple countries uh, that uh, uh, opposed uh, or were not sufficiently enthusiastic to support it. So uh, one of the things that uh, the international community needs to do is to get behind this, uh, uh, mobilize behind getting this uh, $500 billion SDR. It's small compared to the $3 trillion that the U.S. is spending, but uh, it would make a, a big difference. The second big issue in finance is while the rest of the world has been put on hold, um, you know, a, a, in response to COVID-19, the financial sector continues to rack up money to charge interest um, and charge interest and interest penalties for late, late. And so there has to be some way of uh, imposing a moratorium um, and be beginning a process of restructuring. The UN in 2015 passed a set of principles for restructuring sovereign debt. But unfortunately, because of the opposition of a few creditor countries, the, the, those principles uh, have never been uh, put into practice. And again, unfortunately, there are going to be a number of developing countries and emerging markets that are going to face enormous amounts of strain. Uh, we are going to have some debt restructuring. It will either be done in an orderly or a disorderly way. And uh, I'm afraid that if uh, there isn't greater impetus behind uh, a concerted effort to get a orderly way of doing it, it will be disorderly. And finally, let me just mention one idea that's been floated around uh, of linking 
the issue of climate change and a better environment uh, with this debt restructuring. And there's a, a number of proposals for kinds of debt uh, green equity swaps. Uh, the developing countries and emerging markets uh, make an enormous uh, contribution to the environment by uh, uh, what we call it ecological services through their forests, the rainforests, which are disproportionately in developing countries and emerging markets, and uh, uh, a commitment to maintain those uh, ecological services in return for uh, a reduction of debt might be some framework uh, within which uh, the global community can both move forward on the climate agenda and uh, enable a more orderly restructuring of the debts. Inga, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, it's super interesting what we're discussing here and how do we build back better and build back cleaner and build back more sustainably. Um, look, there will obviously have to come resources from external sources, but I want to also highlight that domestic economies, that's actually where the majority of the resources are sitting. Um, Kenya, the country where we happen to be based, pushed out an economic stimulus package very early on in the, in the pandemic. They did that. That was just, that was merely fiscal in nature. They dropped VAT, other taxes, etc., so that people would feel a little more, uh, less stressed. And just on the 23rd of May, ESP, the economic stimulus package two came out. It's massive. That one will focus on infrastructure. And that's really interesting. Um, because, of course, and, and again, yes, it has some national finance backing, but a lot of it is domestically mobilized debt. Um, and that's not without uh, importance here, because much of these resources do not come from the UN or the, the international financial institutions, such as the World Bank, but they come from domestic resources, uh, uh, bond issuance or others. So at this point, um, the second package will focus on infrastructure. And we are seeing that in a number of countries. So the question then is, and this is now a more generic global question, what kind of infrastructure are we gonna do? Are we gonna build more highways? Or are we going to do the proverbial bicycle lanes and uh, public transport? Are we going to build more um, uh, parks and green infrastructure? Or are we going to deal with uh, other aspects that will have a greener uh, sheen, if you like? And on the $9 trillion that have gone out in stimulus, as I think the paper that, uh, that Professor Stieglitz and others published, we have not really picked up uh, as much as we should on the greening side. But we are beginning to see some movements, and I want to stress that. We're beginning to see movement, for example, France pushed, pushed out uh, their stimulus package and they made it very clear uh, to, for example, rescue Air France. But they also said, you get this, but there is a condition attached to it. Don't fly on, I want to say, destinations that were two or two and a half hours because you can take the train. Um, in the UK, they're talking about a stimulus package right now, and they're talking about, okay, yes, but how do we flip that into green jobs? So, um, and I want to highlight Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan pushed out a significant stimulus package through the billion three, a billion tree tsunamis, a massive tree planting uh, scheme. And I want to say that because we're right now on desertification and drought day. And so that massive restoration of our degraded land, the 1.5 billion hectares that are lying degraded, can also be part of the solution. So these are, these are some of the elements that we ignore at our peril. And, and I know, whilst this is not a UN position, it's worthwhile to observe that there are economists who have said, well, look at this time with energy prices being so low that a carbon tax would not be felt and where resources are actually needed in the economy. Some economies and some economists are saying, well, maybe now is the best time ever to push out a carbon tax because that will, drive, uh, that will drive money into the government coffers when the economies are tanking, but it will also allow for a shifting uh, towards a renewable green. 
And here, when we look at the opportunities for retrofitting uh, uh, housing stock that is inefficient, for dealing with um, uh, district cooling and cooling investments and getting them green instead of brown, and for investing in renewables, there are amazing opportunities. So I, I hear very much what Raya is saying that where the fiscal space doesn't exist, you're really stuck between a rock and a hard place. And I want to honor that and, and recognize that that is not an easy fix. But there are, however, other countries where there is more maneuverability and where that forward movement uh, can be made. Let me stop here. Welcome everybody, if you're just joining this conversation, we're looking at the future of development in a post COVID-19 world. For the next 10 minutes, we're really gonna be focused on the idea of building back better. This conversation is your conversation. You have questions, you have suggestions. The panel is here waiting for you. Let me just tell you about Govinda Chowdhury. Govinda, thank you for being part of the conversation. Uh, I'm going to put this question, this thought to you, Bina. And if you feel you want to share it with another one of the panelists, you can, do, you can go ahead and do that. So uh, Govinda says, at present, we want enhanced cooperation between nations to address health and environmental challenges. But contrary to this, nations are talking about reducing economic dependence and becoming self-sufficient economies. Isn't that contradictory? And Dr. Govinda Chowdhury is from the University of North Bengal in Darjeeling in India. Thank you, Dr. Govinda Chowdhury. Bina, what do you say back to that? Well, I actually wanted to come in on uh, the discussion, the building back better, uh, because I think um, yeah, fiscal stimulus is very important, but we need to bring the people back in. And I don't think we can build back better until we, we talk about institutions and we talk about communities. So um, I, you know, we need to remember that we already have a lot of experiments, a lot of positive stories pre-COVID. So it's not like we're going to reinvent the world, but are we going to pick up on those conversations which have been taking place for a while? And one of the most important conversations is uh, really re, uh, you know, reorienting our entire food systems. Um, our agriculture has become extremely unsustainable. Um, so we need to rethink the way we farm. I mean, what are we, what are we producing? How are we producing it? Uh, how are we distributing it? And a lot of people have been talking about agroecological practices, about multi-cropping um, and, uh, you know, organic inputs. And there have been many experiments on this. There's zero budget farming taking place in parts of India, uh, for instance. Um, the, uh, you know, Joe mentioned, um, uh, for instance, in his paper, he talks about the importance of the rural economy and, uh, and also building infrastructure. Now, one of the positive things that's happened is that the government has said that we will vamp up, raise uh, the Employment Guarantee Act in India. So for instance, um, it promises 100 days of of employment uh, for rural households uh, in and this the the wages for this have been increased the, there's a possibility that the number of days may increase the real question is that it's not just creating jobs but it could create um, you know, uh, a green infrastructure. We have huge needs, for instance, to move away from gr groundwater mining uh, to rainwater harvesting systems. Um, we've totally depleted our groundwater and we need alternatives. We could use this opportunity uh, also for um, not just replanting and plantations, but in fact, building up the existing institutions of communities which have been protecting forests. Now it's very interesting, for instance, if you look at forests, we, the previous speakers had mentioned forests, that uh, if you take uh, the, uh, a long period of time, if you look at the FAO statistics, the one continent in which uh, forest uh, area has actually increased is Asia. And why is it? Because they set in place institutions at least two decades ago of community forestry management. And so there's been an increase in uh, uh, of something like 2.2 million hectares per year of forest area in, in Asia. And, and so the point I'm making is that simply funds and money is not going to solve the problem unless we involve people and institutions 
on the ground. I'll give you one other example, which is very important, the COVID uh, situation, which is that people often mention, well, why has Kerala done so well in India? Mm. And uh, a number of things are mentioned, uh, the healthcare system and the decentralization. But Bina, let me point out. Bina, yes. if, if I may, I'm, I, I just, I'm going to give a, a little bit of background about Kerala because okay. while m many other developing areas were struggling with COVID-19, Kerala... Mm -hmm had the most extraordinary plan and strategy where yes. they fought COVID-19 in an extraordinary way. They had funding, they had support, they were taking care of their citizens. It was a very nurturing approach that happened in Kerala that didn't necessarily happen in the rest of India. Do you want to briefly just explain that? Because if you just mentioned Kerala, no, actually bearing in mind this audience, the thousand of people watching will all know that Kerala did amazingly during COVID-19. But if there are a couple of people who don't understand what happened in Kerala, just very briefly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ahead. Because, you know, actually, if you, if you think of the success of Kerala today, we have to go back to the 1990s. And it, it, has, it set in place institutions of decentralized governance. But one of the most important experiments which we don't talk about enough, apart from universal health care, you know, they had a very good health system, is that they uh, built it the, on the backs of um, group, uh, hundreds of women doing group enterprises. Uh -huh. So for so, instance- Sabina, I'm, uh, gonna, I'm gonna push you to yeah. see, do this quickly. You mentioned Kerala, okay. explain what Kerala, why Kerala is, is so extraordinary, and then wrap up, because we have to move our conversation on. But so I'll give you an example. Yeah. So I'll give you one example. Uh, there were 68,000 women doing group farming mm -hmm. and they were able to survive where other farmers didn't. How is it? Because they linked up with the, the hundreds and hundreds of community kitchens, which were also being run by mm -hmm. groups of women. So it's, mm -hmm. it's been a very uh, decentralized, but also very women centric form of development. All right, I hear you, Bina. Uh, we, we're going to move on a little bit because we need to think about building back greener after building back better. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we should be thinking about it all together. Uh, Professor Stiglitz, uh, Govinda Chowdhury had a question and I just want you to respond to it very quickly, if you may. He was talking about uh, reducing economic dependence and becoming self-sufficient economies. This is what a lot of countries the, uh, Govinda Chowdhury is saying are doing, but isn't that contradictory? Just your thoughts on that, his opinion versus well, I your think, opinion. I, I think what the, the COVID-19 showed that we had created uh, global supply chains that were not resilient, uh, that uh, made us more vulnerable, uh, that we focused on the short-term cost savings without thinking about long-term risk. And that reflects uh, a fundamental problem in capitalism that we saw in 2008 where they focused on the short term and we wound up with a global financial crisis. On the other hand, uh, I think what is very clear from the pandemic, like from climate change, is that we have to work together, that we need global cooperation. So we can't go back into ourselves, uh, but we have to manage these interactions better than we have before. So I think what we're going to find is the going in both directions. We're going to have more cooperation, both on climate change and public health, but we will be uh, a little bit more self-reliant and hopefully a little bit more focused on the resilience of our economic and social systems. You are watching People and the Planet, the future of development in a post-COVID-19 world. Thank you for joining over a thousand people. I've on a Zoom platform, on the UNDP website, or on a YouTube platform. Thank you very much. Uh, lots of questions for our panelists, lots of comments as well. We are going to transition into this idea of how do you build back Greener, that resetting of our relationship with our planet, with our environment, how do we do that for a more equitable society? Inga, you have to lead this one. Thank you. Well, let's think about this for millennia beyond that. Um, we have lived within this very regular, um, very reliable temperature setting, minus plus two degrees through the ice ages. That's how stable our Earth systems have been. And um, so at this point, 
we have science overwhelmingly informing us that unless we get our act together, we are going to hit uh, five degrees, between four and five degrees, if we meet the obligations that we have um, made in Paris. We're talking between three and four degrees. And that is a world that we cannot fathom, we cannot begin to understand. So the pandemic has been awful and is awful and is causing deep economic distress. But what lies ahead if we don't deal with these three crises, the climate crisis, the nature crisis, biodiversity is a nerdy word for the same difference, and the pollution and waste crisis, we will not get to where we want to get to. So then what does Build Back Greener mean? Actually, we already have the roadmap and that roadmap is called the Paris Agreement, less than 1.5 degree. That roadmap is called stabilizing uh, biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation. That roadmap is called the Sustainable Development Goals, which we agreed in 2015 that we we're gonna reach this um, uh, by 2030. So now let's break it into its bits. A big driver of all of this misery that we are causing ourselves is our unsustainable production and consumption. What it is we're doing to essentially take out of the surface uh, of the planet um, material, <coughs> which we then uh, create an economic good of. And when we're done with it, we take it out of the environment and we create an economic good. And when we're done with it, we discard it right back into the environment. So we need to think about the manner in which we produce and consume. And we need to think about fundamentally going towards circularity. And that is not a losing proposition. That is a proposition that will lead to jobs, to opportunities. The way we produce things needs to be such that it can remain in, in productive use. That takes some engineering, but it's entirely possible. And you and I and everyone else has a duty to inform ourselves, inform ourselves on our own choices, inform ourselves in our families on the choices we make, inform ourselves in the communities, and yes, in the voting booth, because that's how we impact change. And so understand that governance uh, uh, is not just something that happened to us, but something that we make happen. We get, in a way, the governments we deserve, some philosophers said. So engage yourself in that change that we want to see. Is it going to be difficult? Yes. But that's where the green opportunities are. And, and Joseph has said, Joe Stiglitz has, has written expansively about this. And now when we're beginning to see on the streets of the West and on the North of the South and the East, racism and Black Lives Matter, let's also just add here the understanding of inequity and discrimination and the environment. Because it's often the poorest and yes, those that are most marginal, irrespective of which country, that live downwind, that live where you have toxicity, that live impacted by lead paint, that live impacted by whatever else, whereas those wealthier lives in greener, cleaner, etc. So this story about green development and green stimulus is also a story about justice and equity. Thank you. Ray, you are looking so thoughtful right now. Uh, uh, and I'm just thinking about Lebanon and the neighbors around Lebanon. Uh, and Lebanon has an economic crisis. They don't even have enough money to manage their own country. So the idea of building back greener. Yeah. Is that Sounds an like, opportunity? Yeah. I, 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 may, maybe I'm thinking wrong. Maybe I need to have my glass half full rather than half empty but i know the hardship that is already happening in lebanon so what do you do in terms of green and sustainability what is happening uh, yeah i mean <clears throat> i don't want to sound as if you know you guys are for me it sounds like you know you're talking about something that is so uh, far from the reality we're going through in Lebanon. Um, obviously, greener, I'm, I'm not being, um, please excuse me, I'm not being sarcastic, is not, you know, on the top of our priority list. Now, if you mention sustainability, fine. I mean, there is, uh, you know, certain goals within the SDGs that we have to strive hard uh, to, to achieve. Uh, but I'm, 
you know, environmentally friendly fiscal or monetary policies is not, you know, high on the agenda. You know, we've just defaulted on our, uh, you know, on our foreign debt obligations. And we are now in the negotiations with the IMF uh, for an IMF program. So you're, maybe you're right. Maybe this would present for us an opportunity, but we're really... You know, we have so much that we're struggling with. We are going through one of the most profound challenges ever in the history of, of the country uh, that I think, and for other countries that are, you know, marred the same kind of challenges, uh, sometimes, you know, more pressing, more pressing challenges supersede, uh, you know, uh, Raya. objectives of, of environmental uh, sustainability. Right. Yeah. Akim is dying to talk to you. He is there to yeah. help you. He is there to advise the countries who, who also say building back greener is not on the top of our agenda. I would be shocked if it was mm -hmm. even on their agenda. Akim, mm -hmm. over to you. Well, uh, thank you, Femi and Raya. I recognize exactly the setting you describe. Um, and yet in Lebanon, there are many who are actually advocating also for a greener set of development choices in the country. So let me go back to perhaps the bridge between the previous focus and this session. I think one of the things we have to begin to recognize is the age of trade-offs is over because much of modern development has essentially been a trade-off, future against the present, rich against the poor, um, the, the people versus environment narrative. At the beginning of the 21st century, whether you're a Lebanese citizen, an American citizen, somebody from Botswana or somebody from a small island development state, maybe in, in Palau, first of all, there are phenomena that are playing out that simply affect everyone. It doesn't even matter what you do in your own country. It is just a fact of life, whether it's climate change uh, or whether it's the loss of species. So we, we are in a different age. And I think we have to tackle head on this notion of trade-offs because basically trade-offs very often legitimize the choice for those who are doing quite well at the expense of those who are not at the table. I learned this in a very clear way when I led the World Commission on Dams and we looked at how the choice of a building a large dam is very often a choice that people take between uh, those who make decisions about what they need, for example, electricity, and those who actually are losing in a river basin uh, in terms of ecology are not even at the table. You also have to be careful because economics, and I am an economics graduate and there are many students online, even teaches us to perfection on how to trade off the future against the present, the notion of discount rates. And I alert you all to challenge this paradigm because it legitimizes choices that are essentially at the expense of the next generation. Now, to the reality, I think it is important that we begin to look at, you know, uh, the greening of our economy is not as a separate track. This has as much to do with equity as it has to do with sustainability. The choices we make about agriculture, the choices we make about uh, the energy systems we use. Why is it that on the African continent in the year 2020, there are 600 million people who still don't have access to electricity? This is a matter of a failure in development choices, not just a matter of you know, not being able to do it. And the opportunity to now invest in clean energy is a very palpable way of putting shovel ready stimulus projects to work that will actually benefit the poor who have no access to electricity, the fundamental driver in development. So we have to get out of the notion of being able to, you know, trade off one against the other. Development, sustainable development, as Raya said, is precisely overcoming the notion that it is people against nature. It is the present generation against future generations. This has got to stop. And this is why we need to get to a point where we rethink our economies and the future of development in a different way. I love the fact there is a dog here. Maybe I could just come in on the dog. <laughs> my dog who is agreeing with me. She's been sitting at my feet for three months now. And she's getting all the debate about uh, recovery. Uh, if I just may, there is some very interesting, there are some interesting studies, including on Lebanon, that looks at just the brown side, the cost of environmental degradation, and showing how, you know, around three percentage points get shaved off by pollution, water, toxicity, and sure. air due to loss of productivity, due to asthma, due to days off, etc. So that's just on the brown, let alone with the green. So, but I, I don't want to minimize the very reality that Raya and Lebanon is sitting with. I speak as a former vice president for the Middle East and North Africa of the World Bank, so I get it. But uh, clearly there are some real opportunities here as well. 
but obviously you need to stabilize at the moment the political setting, which is yeah. another story exactly. altogether. Exactly. But uh, I do think that understanding of the cost of not doing stuff uh, is very high and is ever increasing the more, the more our demograph uh, demographic pressures are. And mm -hmm. so um, that idea that we can pollute ourselves to wealth and then clean up later on, that was yesterday's model and it didn't exactly work out well for us uh, as a global community. I am hearing panel about thoughts, ideas, uh, passion, what we need to do, a lot of what we need to do. I'm not hearing what we're doing, but maybe this is why we're convening. Bina, this idea of building back greener from your perspective, enlighten us. What is happening? Is anything happening? Yes, lots is happening. And firstly, I, I agree with uh, uh, that we don't have to have a trade-off uh, between uh, uh, you know, uh, building green and uh, reducing poverty, for instance. Uh, and, you know, nor are the poor simply, uh, uh, you know, passive recipients. So I think the image that was painted earlier that uh, people are taking away and the poor are not resisting is just incorrect. In fact, if you look at what's happening and what's been happening on forests, on water conservation, on soil conservation, there's been huge amounts of cooperation among poor communities to uh, rebuild. Um, uh, in terms of, I've mentioned the example of community forestry, uh, and, and that's made a huge difference uh, to increase in canopy cover. And I would, I would say, Raya, I mean, I think if you look at some of these examples, uh, take rainwater harvesting. Now, um, it isn't happening enough, and, uh, but that's another area where if you, you create green jobs, you uh, increase the infrastructure environment, and you hugely increase crop yields. Uh, similarly, we've been talking about, uh, you know, uh, transforming our food systems and our agricultural systems. Now, we've known for a long time that the Green Revolution strategy doesn't work, and people have been now pushing towards more agroecological practices, uh, much more, um, you know, uh, organic practices, like if you take Sikkim in India, uh, it's uh, declared as predominantly almost entirely organic. So I think we, the, the, you were quite right to, uh, to ask this question that let's look at what we've been doing right and build on that. And what we've been doing right is building institutions at the community level, at the regional level, and cooperating. So this model of um, I, very, I think it's very important that we move out of the model of constant competition to the model of cooperation. And those are the success stories that we see, um, uh, it, it, both in terms of greening as well as in terms of how we've been dealing with pandemics and tsunamis. We have been having this conversation with our panel. We're looking at the future of development in the post-COVID-19 world. You're on the UNDP website, you're on Zoom, you're on YouTube, you're having those conversations. Some of them I'm bringing in and, and, and sharing your thoughts, your ideas with our panel. And now here is the high risk moment, the bit when we go live to people who are in the conversation as a broadcaster. I know that this could be extremely exciting. So let me just say hello to the Deputy Permanent Representative of Indonesia. He's Ambassador Mohamed Koba. Ambassador, I'm hoping to be able to hear from you any moment now. So we will sit tight and, and magically you will appear. Hello, Ambassador. Uh, very briefly, what did you want to add? What are we missing from this conversation? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. I know a lot of people are interested and are posting a lot of questions, so I will make this uh, opportunity the most. Um, my question to, not to specific panelists, but... Yeah, it's really interesting. Maybe rather to our panelists, is the, the international co-person aspect of the whole uh, COVID-19 and the, and the impact. So, Many developing countries have limited well, um, policy space. It's, um, how I, the world I am can just going to. I am just going to ask whoever to is chatting from the team. More green, Hello. more. Um, whoever is talking like, from the team. They, they talk about food systems. This is this is the chain, this is the exciting bit. Okay, whoever is talking from the team, we hear you. You are now in our live conversation, so you are going to have to stop briefing whoever it was that you were briefing, so that we can get back to the ambassador. Ambassador, please put your microphone back on. I'm 
Manish, who is back behind the scenes. Can you put the ambassador's microphone back on? Ambassador, I do apologize. We were getting ready for the next person. This is the exciting bit, okay? We never know what is gonna happen. Ambassador, recap. Uh, Manish, put the microphone back on. Ambassador, welcome back to the conversation. Please okay. start again. Sorry. Can you hear me now? We hear you beautifully. Go ahead. Okay, no other briefing you. will take place. Go ahead. My, my question is about the international cooperation aspect and solidarity to build back better and ensure that no one is uh, left behind. As you all know that many developing countries have a limited policy space and limited resources. So international cooperation and solidarity must come into play. Um, how do we significantly reduce uh, uh, digital divide as we have witnessed during this pandemic? Because I think ICT, uh, access to ICT and capability uh, would be beneficial for people to, uh, such as, you know, uh, digital, digital learning, medicine. Also, how do we develop health system and industry to increase country capacity in providing universal health coverage uh, and overcoming future health emergency? Because health and, and you know, um, SDG are very much interrelated. And lastly, how do we establish a more resilient society based on local capabilities, including developing local environment, uh, friendly technologies that will be beneficial for the people. Thank you, moderator. All right, thank you very much, Ambassador. That's a lot of how-tos. Let me just, um, <laughs> let me go to Akim. Akim, I, I can't ask you to answer all of those because that's a lot, but it does give you uh, an opportunity to talk about the human development report that's coming up later on this year. And that probably will answer a lot of the questions that the Ambassador is bringing up. Can you speak to us briefly about that? Very briefly, and, and thank you um, to our dear colleague, uh, Master Ringo. Very briefly, first of all, the 2019 Human Development Report identified digitalization in the development process as potentially one of the great positive forces, but also potentially one of the great amplifiers of inequality. So we have been recognizing this for a while. We have been learning from many countries across the world on how digitalization of development can be shaped in a way that is more inclusive. And in fact, yesterday in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a new article was published that looked at the impact of digital in terms of development. It's overwhelmingly positive, whether it is for the poor who are connected, whether in terms of being able to access the financial system, which they never could in the past, for women who are able to address issues in terms of livelihoods, access to information, there is no question that digitalization is fundamentally transforming possibilities. So. I think to your point, in this recovery process, we have learned in just a condensed period of three months, things that we thought would unfold over five to 10 years. So this is a great accelerator. And in the Human Development Report, indeed this year, what we're trying to do is, is to address the traditional approach of measuring human development, which is the capabilities approach, to go back to Mabu Bulhak and Professor Amartya Sen's original crafting of this and, and connect it also to what we're discussing here today, that to look at human development divorced and separated from nature, from the way our planet functions, from the access to natural resources, whether at community level or in the way that governments deal with rights to land, rights to resources, these issues belong together. We are in an age where we have to manage systemic challenges. And so the state craft of running government, of policy becomes critical. And by extension to your point, we need to look at this, and Professor Stiglitz and others have alluded to it as well. We, we have to work as a global community of nations. There are many issues here in which we can actually succeed faster if we work together or we can fall apart. And so I think the logic goes from you know, the availability of technology to rethinking how we measure successful development, but also to how international cooperation will allow us to succeed, including, and this is very critical, there are many developing countries who will face an extraordinarily difficult period. President Stiglitz already alluded to it. Debt defaults, the debt crisis towards the end of this year and next year, because of that point that Raya spoke to. Many countries are borrowing extraordinary amounts of money right now, domestically and internationally, in order to stabilize a crisis. But this is adding to the debt burden. We need a way in which we can have creditors believe in the need to look at standstills of debt, but also debt restructuring. And I think the public in those countries will also be more ready to look at this from a perspective of, well, if we forgive debt, if we write off debt for developing nations, what will be done with it? And we need to come up with positive visions of what those resources could be deployed into. 
uh, whether it's a greening transition, whether it is access to electricity, whether it is addressing the digital connectivity, why is it that 86% of school children in these uh, pandemic response were essentially deprived of their education because they don't have access to digital connectivity. We could connect all schools across the world in the next two to three years without any difficulty to the internet, not only addressing the challenges of managing a pandemic in the short term, but actually creating an educational leapfrogging opportunity that is without precedent. These are the opportunities that we need to address and they are not just environment, they're not just poverty, they are about the kind of development that we are able to shape in today's world. Back to you, Femi. All right. Uh, we have 10 minutes I just left. Added. Uh, we have okay. 10 minutes left. Bina, I'm, I'm going to push on unless you can do it in one sentence because I have a whole line of people who are ready to talk to you. Do it in a sentence. Go ahead. Very brief. One sentence just to say in Kerala, they had 2.2 million mobile phone connected, the women, and with 190,000 uh, WhatsApp to convey messages on COVID. So it's a great opportunity. I was just supporting the previous point. Uh, mm -hmm. And also extension to farmers. You know, you, if you can't meet them face to face, it's a great opportunity to actually um, provide uh, extension services to farmers. And I think there was an RCT done by Michael Kramer recently, which showed how much impact this had. It made a huge difference. Kerala in India is getting lots of love, uh, deservedly yeah, so. The look, other look example is from Africa, yes. Fantastic. I, I, and and Palis, I, I do apologize for pushing you now because this conversation is with you and a thousand other people and they want to put some questions to you. For instance, Francesco yes. Semprini is a journalist at La Stampa. Hello, Francesco. Thank you for your patience. What do you want to add to our conversation? What do you want to ask? Well, first of all, let me thank you for these opportunity i'm very glad to see you all and uh, wishing to see you all in person very very soon my question is for uh, professor stiglitz uh, professor good to see you again we met last time in uh, new york during a conference it was early fall and uh, you know the world was a bit different uh, uh, from then a lot has happened change and uh, specifically on Italy you know Italy is one of the country that has been uh, hard hit by COVID along with uh, but respect to US and China Italy is a much smaller economy and it was a reg this not only from economic point of view but even uh, from a political governance point of view professor Siglitz, you uh, mean know very well italy not only from economic point of view but also from a political point of view what you see in the future of the country in the post covid era for italy in terms of uh, uh, sustainable recovery and uh, do you think that the Italian government uh, is doing uh, well in terms of economic policy, especially, you know, the five star movement that you know very well is, uh, you know, complying these electoral promises. And my last question is this, Europe, uh, Europe uh, is, is a more reliable political union after the 800 billion euro allocated for the recovery fund. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for that question. Um, first, I wanted to say one thing about uh, the previous question. Uh, I am a little concerned uh, that while digital has enormous opportunities for increasing equality, and we've heard some of the great examples, uh, it is also having uh, some effects on inequality. Uh, there are a few firms who dominate the digital world. Uh, they are becoming wealthier and wealthier. Uh, and many of them are not paying their fair share of taxes. And I've been involved in others uh, in a global movement to try to get a fair tax system. Uh, the multinationals have taken advantage of globalization to avoid paying taxes. And if we're going to have a sustainable and, and equitable recovery, uh, this issue of, of, multi, of reforming the multinational uh, tax system, the corporate tax system, I think has to be towards the top of the agenda. Uh, on the issue of Italy, uh, one of the things that has happened uh, within Europe, I think that's very positive, is that, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there, there has been a resolve to come together for the first time issuing uh, 
uh, euro bonds, uh, recognizing that the individual countries can't solve the problem on their own. Uh, even before the crisis, Europe was, uh, Italy was very, very, very forceful about talking about uh, changing the growth and stability uh, fiscal constraints to talk about uh, uh, having a, what's called a green rule, that you could spend more money if you were investing it in the future and investing in the future uh, in a green way. Um, what worries me is that there are still some countries within Europe who uh, have uh, want to impose conditions on the assistance uh, to the countries that are adversely affected like Italy and Spain uh, that want uh, the money to be provided in the form of loans rather than uh, transfer payments. Um, and uh, it seems to me that if European solidarity is really to be demonstrated, and if countries like Italy are going to have a strong recovery, uh, that uh, the money has to be provided in the form of gifts, uh, in terms of transfers, not loans. Uh, they already have too big of a debt burden. And the conditions should be just focused on making sure that the money is spent to try to create the vision that has already been put, uh, a green Europe uh, and a more equitable Europe. I want to bring in to our conversation Ugochi Daniels, he's the UN resident coordinator to Iran. Hello, welcome to our conversation. I'm going to ask you to have a brief question and for the panel to respond briefly. We have nine more minutes in this conversation and then we're going to wrap it up. Gochi, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Femi, and much appreciation to the panelists for a really interesting discussion so far. I'll be quick. Um, what are the examples out there of economic interventions that produce more equitable outcomes? I'm the UN resident coordinator in Iran. Um, I asked the question because the most vulnerable and marginalized are bearing the brunt, both in terms of loss of lives and livelihoods. But they seem not to be the focus of packages that have been announced by governments around the world. So what examples can we showcase to governments in our advocacy? Here in Iran, growth has been weak, jobless, and inequitable, as we can see through contraction of GDP. Employment generation is flat and, the, is flat and declining, and the Gini coefficient is rising. So, um, Igochi, I'm not Igochi, do you really not yes. know the answer to that question that you're asking? Well, I, I you know the answer, answer to that question. question. But I'd like to hear it from the panel. You'd like to hear it from the panel. You tell yeah. us the examples. You tell us the examples. Share your knowledge, because I know that that question was, I want to share this piece of information. Tell us a couple of examples, Igochi. No, no to, be, to be really honest, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of examples that I think a country like Iran that's in this situation that is an upper, that is an upper middle income country but yeah. has been dealing with these issues prior to COVID and COVID has exacerbated this. So this is common in many, um, in many countries and the, the packages- Okay, Ogochi, I, I, I hear you, I hear you. All right, uh, Akim, go ahead. Well, I think Ogochi is speaking to a phenomenon that I think partly we in the United Nations are very conscious of right now that we have a very important role to play, which is in an extremely fast forward mode to share best practices and innovations across the globe, because every country is struggling with similar issues in very different circumstances. Back to Raya's point, I mean, we have countries that are in the midst of, of, of deep economic crisis. We have countries such as Yemen, the Central African Republic, Libya, but then you also have the Malaysias and the Singapores and, and Europe and the United States. So I think the interesting thing that we're observing right now is that sometimes it is not a matter of whether you're a rich country or a poor country, whether your policies are effective. Let's look at the, the examples we've heard about this morning, Kerala, Vietnam. We have a number of countries who have been very successful, and it is not because they are the richest or the most technologically advanced. So policy matters, and that is one very important part. The second thing is, can we focus on the most vulnerable who are also most at risk? 
the fact that 80% in many developing economies are essentially depending on the informal sector for their livelihoods has meant that countries very quickly had to find a way in which to provide them with access to cash because lockdown, no income, no work, no social safety net. So we have seen in Togo a cash transfer scheme set up. We have seen in Pakistan a, a cash transfer scheme being established that is reaching 12 million households. And I could go on with many of these examples. How do we identify the poor? And part of our work as the UN family, since Ogochi is on the line, has been also to work with governments on their socioeconomic response. The best way in which you can balance, for example, rescuing major corporations or industries in your country, which takes an extraordinary amount of money. But how do you then deal with the dilemma that you, yes, you might be saving 10,000, 20,000 jobs in the formal sector in an industry, but you could, with the same amount of money, actually save a million livelihoods uh, who are the small, medium scale enterprises, the informal sector workers, making informed choices, being able to use the best of technology to identify uh, where do we find people like this? There is enormous advances that are being made. And I think the way these mitigation measures are being established right now teaches us a lot. If in a society there is a commitment to saving those who are most vulnerable, to leaving no one behind, as the SDGs also remind us, then very different policies emerge. And we, and we have an extraordinary collection. There are many success stories right now, and there are some very bitter failures. That is the truth of this moment. Gochi, thank you very much for your question. I'm going to fit one more question in. And panel, this is your two-minute warning. I would like you to think of a sentence that will send people away appreciating what is possible in development post-COVID-19. We have a little bit of thinking time, but not much. We are going to wrap up this panel at five minutes past 11. Radmila Sulamanova is a journalist at Al Jazeera. I have heard of that network. Hello there, Radmila. What is your question? Be brief. Hello there. Thank you so much. What a wonderful panel. Um, this question is for Professor Stiglitz, but I would love for anyone else to jump in. Uh, we had a major youth unemployment crisis before the coronavirus hit, and now it's so much more worse. And we've seen in recent months and weeks that young people have so much passion about impacting the world. What role do you think that they have to play, and what can they really do to ensure that whatever change they uh, put forth now lasts and has a positive impact. A uh, great question. Uh, one of the things that's most concerned to me is that the young people are going to be, uh, particularly those graduating this year uh, and next year, are going to be the most affected uh, by that in terms of their economic opportunities. But I think we've seen in the United States uh, a kind of idealism among uh, young people, uh, but an idealism that's actually having an effect. Uh, they made it very clear that the system of uh, racial injustice, which has been part of the, of the United States uh, forever, uh, has to stop. And it's actually penetrated, I think, more broadly into the body politic. You know, I, I, I marched uh, more than 50 years ago over the, the civil rights issues. And, and uh, it was very frustrating to see how little impact that we had. But sometimes change takes a long time. And I, I think we are beginning to see that change. So I think uh, young people uh, have to focus on that. They have to focus, you know, the, the Extinction Rebellion uh, brought the reality that young people are going to be inheriting the future of the earth. And if they don't get a green earth, they're going to be the ones who are paying the price. And so I think it's really uh, powerful when they have raised their vo voice uh, on, uh, on the climate change. Um, so it's, since I have to go, can I just answer your one sentence uh, uh, questioning uh, of what you should take away. I think the big takeaway uh, really reflects what uh, all the panelists have talked about, which is we can create a post-pandemic world which doesn't just pick up where we left off, but actually moves us significantly along in the direction that we aspired uh, with the sustainable goals, a, a greener world, and uh, 
one that's marked more by a greater social justice and promotes uh, the development uh, of the poorest countries of the world. Professor Stiglitz, many thanks for joining us today. You may mute your mic and you are dismissed. Bina, <laughs> your one sentence. I, I know this is going to be a good one. We've had so many great ones for this conversation. But your one sentence, Bina. Your my, students my are one, watching. Okay, my one sentence or shorter is really three principles. The principle of cooperation, uh, the building on communities, and building a society which conserves. Ah, it's been great having you. Thank you so much, Bina. Thank you. Raya, Raya, the voice of yeah. practicality, the voice of pragmatism. She's making us think very hard in this conversation. What is your one sentence, Raya, that you want so, to leave us yeah. with? Um, global coordination and cooperation versus deglobalization. And that's the term I think coined by Mr. Stiglitz. And localizing SDGs. That's the only hope that we have, I think, for our communities in the region. Uh, because of the uh, huge pressures that are on central governments, we need to basically empower local governments and local development. Thank you, Raya. Thank you so much. Inga, one of the co-hosts of our high-level dialogue. Inga, that sentence, that sentence that should be seared into our brain that we walk around with all day and actually okay. all year. What, what is that? <laughs> After COVID-19, nothing will be the same, but life can be much better. We are beginning to understand that without nature, without the earth systems, we have nothing. So we have to adjust our lifestyles and our footprint, adjust our economies, stabilize our environment, and reduce the stuff that we keep accumulating and do and live with a, with a mindful eye on our own footprint and on that of society. Thank you so much, Inga. Thank you for co-hosting. And Akim, the other co-host, go ahead. Well, the fact that we are co-hosting is also an expression of our partnership in rethinking the Human Development Report this year. To those who are looking for perspective for a new way of thinking about the choices we just discussed, please follow the Human Development Report that is being written as we speak and will be launched uh, towards the end of the year. And to everybody out there, just to align myself with what has been said, I think the direction is clear. Count also on us in the United Nations. We are not just institutions. We are an expression of an idea precisely to the necessities that my uh, dear co-panelists have just addressed. So the United Nations is not sitting back. We are leaning forward. And if the one sentence I can leave you with is, we have choices. We can make choices. Let's make wise and informed choices. Thank you, Fanny. This has been a UNDP, a UNEP co-production. My name is Femi Oke. It has been a, ble a pleasure moderating it for you. All oh, 1,000 plus some of you. Thank you, panel. Thank you, audience. Appreciate your time. Take care, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.